Νομίζω είμαστε έτοιμοι να ξεκινήσουμε. Καλώς ήρθατε. And I'm going to switch to English right away, since this talk will be delivered in English. So, good afternoon, everybody, to people in the room and also to those uh, watching uh, the talk uh, from distance through Zoom or through the live stream. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome back to the Technical University of Crete and the School of ECE, Fotios Ligerakis, who is a recent graduate uh, of our school. In particular, he received the integrated diploma, the integrated master degree in 2019. And before starting his PhD at the University of Leuven in Austria, he held uh, different positions at the University of Texas at Arlington, also at the National Center for Scientific Research Democritus in Athens, and uh, uh, finally as a research center intern at Toshiba Research Europe in Cambridge, UK, where we also had a very nice collaboration and we authored a couple of papers. Um, his work uh, includes contributions to various aspects, uh, uh, topics uh, of uh, machine learning, data science, uh, and robotics, particular representation learning, reinforcement learning for robotic manipulation, healthcare robotics, and dialogue systems. Um, currently, Fotis is a doctoral student and university assistant at the Chair of Biophysical Systems at the University of Leoben in Leoben, uh, Austria, since March 2022. And he focuses there on the representation and robot learning, employing self-supervised learning methods, both contrastive and non-contrastive, as well as reinforcement learning techniques, specifically targeting manipulation tasks. Now, today, we're going to hear from Fotis uh, about uh, uh, a topic with the title From Sense to Dexterity, Self-Supervised -supervis Representation Learning, Visual Tactile Fusion, and Robot Learning for Manipulation. So thank you, Fotis, for being here on this hot day of summer. <laughs> and we're looking forward to listening to your talk. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you for the very extensive uh, introduction <laughs> in so many words about me. Um, um, so, hello everyone, my name is uh, Fodis. But before I introduce to you a bit more about myself, um, I want you to get some back and uh, imagine a very simple task for humans. Imagine you're like walking down um, a very busy street and you want to get your wallet from uh, your wallet. What you do is to locate the vision where your backpack is and where the opening is, open it, then create a trajectory with your hand to get it inside uh, your backpack, and then you can feel different things without using your vision. You can feel the rigid uh, notebook, uh, that you're having there, you can feel the cold metallic feeling of uh, your keys, and uh, somewhere there you can feel the yielding soft touch of your wallet, where you can grasp it, but just enough so you don't squeeze it, but to secure it in your hands and get it out. This is a very simple task for uh, humans, um, working together different sensing modalities and using them uh, to seamless, seamlessly uh, manipulate objects. But this is a big problem for robotics, and for my research, this is something that uh, I want to tackle. Overall, my research goes from sensing to control, where I want to uh, learn good representations of modalities, efficiently fuse them uh, for robot learning algorithms to be able to learn and hopefully manipulate things on the real world. The research questions uh, uh, I want to uh, answer during my PhD, and I have answered uh, at some extent, is how we can learn better representations, how we can efficiently fuse different sensing modalities, how we can teach robots to perform tasks with high accuracy and robustly. A uh, small uh, outline um, of the of this talk, we're going to have a small introduction, and then we're going to talk about my research. Firstly, uh, I'm going to give you a bit of uh, background. to 
Valencia, uh, the team uh, in San or San Diego Research Portos. Um, then I the University of Texas at Arlington as a graduate, graduate teaching assistant. And then finally, uh, in this right now, uh, a very small uh, alpine in the University of Leoben, where I'm a, do a doctoral student and a university assistant. Okay, as I told you, uh, my research involves around two um, with eight. We get raw data from sent and with in use of time. from which you, uh, um, an encoder, we can get information. In this case, is the activations of a neural network. So as I said, raw data can be pixels. Here you can see the three different channels of a pixel, red, green, blue, different values, which actually don't mean anything because it has a lot of noise, a lot of things that are not important, like the background, depending on what we want to do uh, with this information. And then a representation vector, which is what we actually need, is the squeezed information from this raw data, which is essentially um, a vector, a very sm uh, lower dimensional uh, representation of the input. And an encoder could be just usually, like what I use is a neural network. So how do we get the representations? There are different ways. We can get them with a supervised learning where you train end-to-end a neural network that consists of an encoder and a classifier. You say that this raw data uh, maps to a dog. At this case, you try to predict uh, from uh, which, which class is most probable for this raw data. And then just when you have it trained, discard the classifier and use the encoder. Now, the problem with this is that the features that you learn in the representations are very task specific. So if you have a classification problem, you learn uh, representations that are um, learned for this specific task. But can we do better? Um, there are other methods that uh, don't use uh, labels on the data. But, um, and this method is called self-supervised self -supervised learning. Where you usually where you use an inherent learning signal signal from uh, the data. Some examples of these is uh, reconstruction or autoencoder, autoencoding, uh, where um, after the representation you just add a decoder um, network in order to reconstruct what you initially had in the input, and your signal there is comes directly from your input, so you try to reconstruct. The, the input, so we don't actually need labels, we just need pictures. Um, another technique for self-supervised learning is joint embeddings. When you say you have two different encoders, or you, you can also have the same encoder, uh, you give an anchor image, the original image, and you also give a positive sample. You can, for example, perturb a little bit, you can change the color, drop it. It's also the same thing. So the representation that these two encoders learn should be similar. You can use contrastive learning for that, you can use regularization techniques or energy-based models. But why bother with self-supervised learning? We bother because we can utilize a patent unlabeled data and uh, it can give us a in task agnostic, so you don't have to train every time for your specific task. And they're also efficient. But first, a bit of background, as I told you. Encoders and variation of encoders. What an autoencoder is, as we also saw in the previous slides, um, is a neural network that has a very narrow latent space. And this is where you want to squeeze all the information. Um, you have an input layer, you have an output layer, and you try to reconstruct. This is the last one here. You try to reconstruct the output from the input. So if you're far away, you have a big loss function, your loss function is bigger, and you try to minimize that. And at the end, you're gonna use this latent uh, representation for whatever downstream task you wanna do, application, operation, just input to um, whatever. Now, a variational encoder is a version of 
adds a bit of regularization of the latent space. Instead of directly learn uh, the representation, you learn parameter distribution of representations. So in this case, we assume that uh, the distribution is Gaussian. So you learn uh, the mean and uh, the standard deviation. More because usually where like high dimensional, you learn the mean vector and the covariance matrix, but doesn't really matter here. Um, and the difference with the simple unicoder is that you add this um, KL divergence at the end of it, which is the regularization. We'll, we'll see in a bit um, uh, what this KL divergence means. Um, another technique is contrastive learning for self-revised representational learning, where essentially you have um, to do two similar uh, images, and you say that make these two images similar. And we have two dissimilar images, uh, for example, the original image and the negative image, and you say, make this dissimilar. Um, the way that you do it is, so that I would say are uh, vectors, and they are vectors on a unit sphere. That means that their uh, magnitude is one. And the only thing that we care about is their angle. Um, so if you see, uh, we have the purple, and this is the vector as it is. And uh, what do you want to bring the positive uh, sample closer to uh, anchor vector and the negative sample further away from the anchor sample? And the way to do that is using uh, the info and C loss. Essentially, what this um, uh, uh, formula does is in the nominator, you have um, the nominator makes uh, the representation similar, and the denominator, denominator makes uh, um, your representations dissimilar. So, for example, in this case, zi and zj, you put them, you plug them in in the nominator, and every negative sample you plug it in the denominator. What is sin? Is just to say the function? Excuse me. What is sin? S i n. Uh, it's a similarity function. Usually, we use the cosine similarity, but you can use any um, any similarity function. So you normalize by the length of the vector. Yeah, if you just, that, that's why I said we're in the unit, a unit sphere, because cosine similarity actually uh, normalizes it. So you ignore the differences? In the, mag in the magnitude, yeah. Why? It, um, because uh, you, um, you want to ignore it because it uh, creates uh, problems with uh, learning uh, stability. Uh, you actually try to squeeze the representation space that you can search for these representations. Um, and a lot of times, if you have a bigger space that is not normalized, your representation space, um, you have a collapsing phenomena. For example, you just learn the trivial solution that everything is just the same. You represent everything uh, the same. Uh, so it has been shown by a lot of papers that cosine similarity actually works better, especially when you have images. There's a problem with cosine similarity, or there might be a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, a representation vector is, uh, has low... Okay. Oh. okay. Uh, there might be a problem with um, cosine similarity, because if you use... Uh, if, if it happens and the representation vector is, has small magnitude, Mm -hmm. and you uh, scale it to have norm 1, then you, uh, basically you in, include error. I mean, if it, the mountain is small, then there must be a big uh, error in terms of uh, the angle. And, well, and this is something that you like to ignore. So if you take into account the magnitude, this will that's handle actually, the problem with the yeah, yeah. I, error. I actually try to um, play with the similarity functions uh, but I see this collapsing phenomena all of the time. Uh, because all these representations come from a network and you have a lot of regularization throughout the layers of the neural network, actually um, the, the noise is normalized there and um, you don't know what noise is actually, especially for images. And you try actually to model noise too, in the representation space, and the, um, when you have a downstream task, then this downstream task um, figures out if what what is noise. 
because for some tasks you want to also um, uh, have the background as part of information, but sometimes that's not background. So it depends on the task. You want to represent everything efficiently. And at these days, you don't know what noise is, to be honest. Yeah, and please uh, interrupt me if you have questions because it's a long. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, another question. Uh, can you go back a couple of slides? The, uh, the previous one, this one, okay. The, the latency page. Oh, hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so you start from an uh, input layer, which might be a big image. Yeah. So this is the vectorized uh, image in pixels. It can be vectorized, or if you're using CNN, is the actual image. If you're using yeah, the Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and then you get uh, the red node, which is a value? It's a vector. Okay, this is a vector. Mm -hmm. um, so the the, um, the outputs of each, uh, the output of each uh, uh, green node is a vector as well or not? I'm trying to figure out. It depends what kind of uh, neural network you use. If you use a, a fully connected neural network, uh, it's actually matrices because these are neurons. The, the green ones is whatever neural network is. Uh, blue is input and output. It's numerical. Okay, the, the first, the top green uh, left, top left green node mm -hmm. uh, takes uh, as an input the entire image. Yeah, and because it's fully connected, this and happens. and gets in the output uh, a vector. Okay, got it. Uh, okay, but the the red one is uh, still is a vector, right? Yeah, it's a lower dimensional vector. For example, if okay. you have an image that is two fifty six by two fifty six, mm -hmm. three channel, which are the features that you want to exactly. This is what we actually okay. want okay. to learn and use later on. Good, thanks. Later. So. Now that we have the background uh, about the basic uh, presentation learning methods, let's get back to uh, research. And the research question one that I wanted to answer is how we can learn better presentations from VAEs. Um, so uh, as I said, a VAE has the architecture of an encoder and a decoder. And uh, if you see it from a variational inference uh, perspective, the encoder is the posterior distribution of the input X uh, of the um, presentation. of X given latent the latent representation uh, is uh, actually a distribution, uh, a Gaussian distribution. Um, now, a problem, um, before we talk about the problem and the inherent VA's problem, let's talk about how we train that. As we said, we have uh, a loss that consists of a reconstruction loss between the input and the output. It's usually the mean square error loss or the binary cross entropy, depending how you model the output. And then you have a weighted KL divergence uh, that comes from the actual loss of uh, the variational autoencoder, which is the negative elbow, uh, evidence lower bound. And the KL divergence is between uh, the posterior, which is actually the encoder, and um, the prior distribution of uh, your presentation's Z. Now, the problem with that is that scale, the, the, the scale divergence here. That means that if you have a very expressive um, function approximator, as neural networks are, you can create outputs that, are, that look um, uh, very similar to the IMAs, but they are not Exactly, they're not dependent on the image. Because that means that the encoder Q becomes invariant to the input. Actually, exactly the same set. That means that it will not pay attention to the representation, and the representation, therefore, is any information from the input. And what about posterior collapse and the But not your there are many methods to do that. For example, you can play with this beta part there and make it smaller or bigger, and actually um, make a regularization more or less. That 
what we did is to use uh, the elbow surgery equation and split the KL divergence into a mutual information term and the KL uh, of the aggregated uh, prior and the true prior. And in this way, we figure out that minimizing the KL divergence, also this mutual information between the input and the representation is minimized. And this is what we want to avoid. And we, will, we wanted to, to avoid it by deriving a lower bound and maximize it so this mutual information doesn't go to zero. Um, it has been shown that the mutual information between two variables uh, can have a lower bound, uh, like the one that you can see here, it's the log of k, it's k is the number of the bats, of the um, samples in the bats that you have. And um, the other, the LNC is the info in C loss that we described before that is used in contrastive learning. So what we did is to uh, add the influence C loss to the original variational own encoder loss. And with a lot of engineering, we managed to propose a contrastive regular that has smaller uh, reconstructure error, which is exactly what we wanted to avoid posterior collapse, have more truthful images being um, created. Uh, and that's work that we presented at the AECA. 2023. Um, and from there, we, as we said, we have the, the original elbow, we have the elbow surgery that we use for our VAE, and then we the dissection of this KL, KL divergence uh, to the approximate here because to compute this scale divergence there we need to do um, uh, we need to do Monte Carlo sampling or other sampling techniques because we don't have um, an analytical solution for this one. So we showed that we can split this one into an entropy and a cross entropy term and the entropy term it gives you the randomness of the model's latent distribution that you want and the cross entropy gives you the alignment right distribution. Uh, our hope is that we'll have enhanced control of the latent space and have it's also give us access to more flexible prior incorporation to that um, by splitting that into two different set of terms. That's a work in progress. Um, still trying to make it work. Uh, because having too many loss functions going against each other is a bit unstable, actually. And I'm trying to incorporate these loss functions in the network itself by uh, different regularizing techniques. Okay. Uh, is the cross entropy between the approximate uh, Q function and Q um, uh, the approximate prior of the Z of the representation and the true? Okay, you ha you have uh, four terms. The second term is the mutual information of X and Z, right? Yeah. So X is the input and Z is the, the representation. Representation, and then you have the entropy of the representation variable, and the yeah. joint entropy of the representation variable and the representation variable according to its prior. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and the first term is the, the it's an error. It's, a, it's an entropy as well, right? Or yeah, yeah, but it, it it boils down for image that it's the the mean square error. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to understand what is the connection between these four terms. I mean, uh, it, it, there's no connection actually. It's like they are derived from the original uh, uh, Adam's lower bound. I have paper archive on that. It's quite big <laughs> derivations. So uh, the uh, the idea is to minimize this cost function, the first yeah. one, the uh, original elbow, and uh, to minimize it, you want to maximize the uh, the the distance between the. Yeah, you maximize the distance between uh, the prior uh, distribution of the representation and the actual prior, yeah, of the representation. The you of want the representation. To, to, to maximize this. You want to maximize this, and you want to maximize the cross entropy. You want to minimize the entropy. You want to maximize the mutual information, and you want to minimize the the reconstruction error. And you do this because you want to avoid the case where the uh, the two distributions become equal. 
PNT, no, no, no. Right? Um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, the entropy decomposed VE losses actually have better um, flexibility for the prior. So usually you assume that you have a Gaussian prior because it's easier and you have the analytical form of the divergence. Okay. But not everything is, has a Gaussian prior, and uh -huh. you can inject your own. Uh, you can learn the prior, uh, or you can actually uh, inject nodes that you have for the prior. Okay, this is about P, uh, the, the prior. P yeah, the, the prior like, related uh, representation. Because the other you can have the empirical distribution of your data. You don't have actual access to the latent presentation. That's why <laughs> we do the presentation learning. Okay, and the only difference between the first and the second equation is that you split the Kullback library distance between uh, into mutual information and... So you added... Actually, the mutual information, right? Oh no, no, you, 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 you have the, you have the, the unconditional. Okay, got it. Uh, what was your contribution here? Oh, not the original, right? I mean, you, the, the surgery is your part, or mine? The surgery is, uh, mentioned it here. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so we had the recent question, how can we learn better representations from VAEs? And the recent answer to that is the contrastive regularized variational autoencoders. Works. You can feel where the object is and get information about uh, its dynamic visual tactile fusion. Well, we want to utilize abundant and labeled data on representations that are robust. In my opinion. Uh, Passive learning, as we said, things similar and representations of similar representations of and from touch to vision, and altogether we uh, we compose the uh, our loss function. you but here we we pre-train in two different data sets our encoders we froze them and then we test them on a different task and uh, our data set is also vision based and we compared our method with other self-supervised learning methods and with a supervised a directly supervised method so that these representations had access to the the task signal, loss signal. And in with Blue is our method, and it's important to notice here that our method not only outperforms other state-of-the-art um, contrastive learning methods, but sometimes it also outperforms the supervised learning method. That means that the representations that we learn are really good and very informative of the input. Um, the task that we try is a classification of different, different objects, a classification uh, for hardness uh, or texture. And we also show that using vision and touch is um, better than using only touch. You can see that we measured the, the accuracy here uh, for the task. Um, we also tried on a robotic data set a robotic grasping data set from which we had labels uh, for if the grasping was successful or not. And in this case, we didn't manage to uh, outperform the supervised method, which is not common. Like Supervised learning should outperform the sole supervised learning. Um, but we managed to outperform other state of the art. Now, the problem was, and we talked about uh, with uh, the team that actually created this data set, was that the data set was not big enough and not diverse enough. For contrastive learning to work, you need to have a big and diverse data set so your algorithm learns the variation within your data set. So 
Where six question two was how we can efficiently fuse different sensing modalities, and the recent answer is MVTAC, at least for now. Maybe we have more answers later on. So that was everything about perception and moving to control. Um, uh, we implemented uh, visual tactile fusion for model three visual tactile reinforcement learning. Now here the question was uh, how can we teach robots to perform tasks with high accuracy and robustly? What we proposed is multimodal contrastive unsupervised reinforcement learning, or m 2 Crow for short, where we essentially um, use the pipeline we developed for MDTAC, where we're using the two modalities, and we augmented reinforcement learning algorithms like soft actor creating and PPO, and we combined these two losses to create the m 2 Crow loss. Uh, this is the work that we presented uh, last June in Ubiquitous Robotics Conference, and we're glad enough to get the Best Student Paper Award for this one. Um, now we test our algorithm uh, for a different task, including object push, edge follow, and you're going to see in the next slide how they look like. And here, here less is better because the reward signal was very sparse, and you get minus one for every time that, that you don't achieve your goal. So uh, the smaller it is, that means the faster that uh, it learns, uh, it, the, f the faster it solves its task, object push or edge follow. Uh, again, we see that our method outperformed the other state-of-the-art self-supervised learning techniques. And on the top of that, with green, you see the algorithm, in this case, of the actor critic having access to the actual state. So where the object is, where the arm is, everything. And you see that our, with blue, our, um, mo our me method uh, has comparable performance, or sometimes actually it outperforms. It's also important to notice that um, our representational learning technique makes the reinforcement learning algorithms sample efficient. Um, with 100 to 100,000 steps, this is yeah, the, uh, the cumulative reward for 100,000 steps, and we see that it can solve the task even from early. It can do better later on, but uh, and still 500,000 time steps, it's also uh, too few for reinforcement learning algorithms. And this is how the two tasks that I presented to you look like. We have the object pools where you have random trajectory generated, and then you have to follow it. And this is essentially what the algorithm sees. On the left, you have the RGB image, and on the right, you have the tactile sensing. Cool. So the third recent question I posed was how we can teach robots to perform tasks with high accuracy and robustly. And the answer to that, our answer to that is uh, m 2 But what are next steps? And this is the most important thing for me from now on. Uh, there are a lot of problems that have not been solved, and I'm looking forward to, to dive into. First, for perception, is that we need to, um, to also use temporal information when fusing visual tactile fusion. And for robot learning, um, we have the problem of sensorial transfer that we want to do on time to curl. Uh, we want to, do, to pivot towards real world imitation learning, and I'm going to explain why. And my most ambitious uh, uh, plan is to create a visual tactile foundation model. Uh, but first step seem to real on m 2 The problem with um, simulated environments is that they often fail to capture the complexity of real-world tactile scenarios. And that's not quite true because they always fail uh, to capture the complexity of real world. And you can see it on your own from the simulated data, how they look like, and what the real data looks on the real robot setup. Uh, the result is that uh, we have discrepancies between uh, simulated training and real world application. And, and the way to, to fix it is performing domain uh, adaptation. And we, we will do that by training encoder with self-provised uh, learning to represent the same way simulated and real data. So at the end of the day, the algorithm that decide that makes decisions sees exactly the same thing, even if it comes from a uh, simulation of the real world. The problem, another problem that we have to face is that there's no good simulation for tactile sensing. We have a lot of things that are deformable. It's really hard to, um, to simulate these things and be applicable to the real world. 
so we're pivoting towards behavior, behavior cloning and offline reinforcement learning. You can see uh, the setup that we have in our lab. We have a panda arm uh, equipped with two tactile sensors and the UR3 with a two-finger adaptive finger. And uh, before, <laughs> a week before, uh, we received uh, the compartments for the lip hand and uh, when I go back to the watch, I'm gonna start building it. So we have also multi-figure grippers and collect data from them. Um, uh, an important part would be the multimodal data collection. And we're gonna use OpenPitch from uh, Pito's uh, lab, which is a very nice framework that you can install on a MetaQuest and it tracks your hands and then you, you can elaborate either, um, let's see that again. In this case, uh, I'm using the um, uh, simulated environment of a, an Allegro hand that tries to move a cube. But you can also go, it's also extendable to real robots and you can till up your rob robots using this framework. And the last thing uh, that I found out there is a research gap is a visual tactile foundation model. The reason uh, that this gap exists is the lack of uh, diverse and high quality data sets. There are not good simulations and there's no consistent use of tactile sensors because there are vision based uh, sensors, force based sensors, and it's Directionals has different implementations of its sensor, so it's really diverse uh, data. And the foundation models for vision motor control just started to emerge, so there is no uh, best practice yet of how to go there. There are a lot of limitations for every method that I mentioned, and uh, part of my research is to actually tackle these problems. For behavior cloning, uh, uh, it mimics observed behaviors. That means there is no adaptation. Uh, it fails for long-term horizons, and you need really expert demos. And then you can use offline reinforcement learning uh, that you can use any human data uh, because you have the word signal. So even if it's a bad um, example, you know that it's a bad example. But then humans are not microbial. So <laughs> if you try to solve a problem that um, uh, has a prerequisite that you're solving a Markovian problem and your data is not Markovian, then it's still a problem. You have very variance across humans, so you have different uh, distribution modalities uh, that if you just use mean square, it's gonna average them, <laughs> so it will, it will learn nothing. And yeah, the data set size doesn't have enough exploration. And a lot of <laughs> practical things I'm not going to go through. So to sum up, my research goes around sensing and control from representational learning to multimodal, multimodal fusion and uh, robot learning to real world applications. Uh, beyond my PhD, um, uh, supervising a master thesis, uh, successfully two of them uh, so far, and I'm also working with another student. Uh, I created the Neural Coffee, which is a uh, reading group about research papers uh, on neural networks. Uh, in general, I'm writing articles uh, on Medium. I uh, have a few uh, lectures on deep representational learning and some tutorials on YouTube of our uh, lab. My most favorite one, <laughs> every year we're creating a Christmas video with our robots in the lab. And if that sounds cool to you, Feel free to reach me, me or everybody, anybody in our lab. Especially if you want to work with me, this is the topics that you we could go work together as a as a thesis, an internship, or a collaboration, from self-supervised learning to robotic interfaces. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, we more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Foti. Very nice talk, and very interesting. So let's see if we have any questions. We have a few people attending online. I see Professor Christopoulos there, and there were a few others who disappeared, but... <laughs> uh, so Professor Christopoulos, if you have any questions, you have priority since you are uh, away, but... No, uh... Mihaly, thank you. I don't have any questions, actually. There were a lot of problems with the sound, and so I was not able to fully follow the presentation. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did definitely like uh, the subject matter and what I could uh, see from the slides. You know, though I I also I was not able to follow most of the audio. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, um, I, I figured out that something was going on with the uh, sound. That's why yeah, I had this microphone oh, here. But anyway, I'm really sorry. I don't know. Uh, Maybe it was too far away. I'm really sorry no, it, from the audience. Uh, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not sure the problem was uh, yours. I can also barely hear uh, Professor Laudakis, and also sometimes there was no sound at all. At all. So um, I don't know if it's my system or something else. But yeah. Um, okay. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For for uh, giving us this uh, presentation. It, it seems uh, very interesting. I like the stuff that you're working on and um, maybe we can discuss it. I would have been there today, but uh, I have COVID, so I have to, Sorry, to be at home. Also. Yeah, best wishes for uh, recovery <laughs> soon. Okay. Thank you. Great. So any uh, other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, yeah, question uh, from from me would be: uh, You mentioned that uh, um, there's a gap between simulation and uh, real time, re real experimentation. So, mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us a bit more about that? Uh, was your research mostly simulation based? Uh, was it experimental? Both? Uh, yeah. So far, uh, em the empty crawl was only on simulation. Uh, was testing only on simulation. And uh, now we want to try to see how it performs on the real robots and also try to uh, merge that gap that probably we'll have on the real robots. Now, the tasks that we used are not that hard. Uh, that means that it's quite easy to uh, interpolate between the simulated data and the actual data because the tactile information that you get is very, very coarse. It's like if you're do line following, you just need to learn an edge, you know, where if you're on the edge or not on the edge. So the task that the algorithms need to solve, it's really easy. If we manage to do that in the first place with a simple task, then we want to move towards more complex tasks where you actually need to learn uh, to detect textures, slippage, and other things that are important for more um, more complex tasks, and then we're going to have a problem, especially with the simulators that are, are out there. That's why I want to move more towards mutation learning from real-world data, where you have directly uh, um, data from the actual sensors that you're using, the robot and everything, the camera, the lighting, so you don't have to um, to train first in the simulation and then try to transfer it. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Okay, any other question? <laughs> Professor Bicaris? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, great. Uh, I was wondering, uh, Foti, uh, um, trying to, to see uh, the connection between robot learning and uh, representation learning. Uh, is the latent space what you utilize for uh, robot learning since you exactly, have a exactly. low dimensional representation? This is hmm? reinforcement learning algorithms are notoriously um, bad and converging. They need a lot of samples. And the more noise and the more irrelevant noise and the more uncompressed data that you have in the input, the more it's going to take to convert your uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, you cannot give access directly to pixels because it will never convert. So even if you don't use self-supervised learning, you will use some kind of encoder to squeeze this information and you're going to learn them through a very sparse reward signal, which is very inefficient too. And the representations are not very good uh, in quality. So what we try to do is to pre-train on uh, experiences that these or other robots have or even data sets and then use these encoders, either fixed or fine-tune them with the reinforcement learning algorithm, which, as we showed, uh, gives uh, really good sample efficient uh, uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. That was uh, what worked uh, also in our dialogue uh, yeah, exactly. system. So that's a very key observation that uh, reinforcement yeah. algorithms really want a low dimensional... Yeah, uh, we were using LSPI and LSPI is not based on your network, so it doesn't have yeah. the capacity of learning these good representations linear. Mm -hmm. So 
having nonlinear representations actually encapsulates all the complexity that you needed. And then if you have good representations, you don't need something very expressive. You just need a good algorithm and a simple, t and you can solve pretty much all the tasks. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that uh, uh, f to learn good latent representations, it's better to use real data compared to simulated data. I missed uh, that part because, because of the differences between simulation and the real world. Yeah, if you learn only using, if you learn your presentations only on simulated data, it will not capture the variance that there is in the real world. And there is a gap there, and there are many techniques to actually infuse your simulated data with this variation called domain adaptation, where essentially what you do is you have your simulator and you just create variance in every value that you have in the simulator, for example, I don't know, uh, brightness or textures or uh, stiffness of things. And in that way, you try to overcome this, but it's not directed, for example. And that's when you don't have tactile sensing. The tactile sensing, because things are deformed, the, 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 the gels that are on the um, uh, sensors are deformed. And it's really hard to, um, um, to model it. And they're not good simulators so far. There are simulators, but they're very naive and they're very, you cannot use, use them for complex tasks. And now that we have the compute to actually train big behavior cloning models, it's actually easier to, or I hope it's going to be easier. <laughs> it's been shown from up by other labs, and I'm, I'm about to explore it myself. It's going to be easier to actually set up a new task without pre-programming it on the simulator, uh, which is a big burden. And you just set everything up, you give a few demos, and then it learns to do the task. Okay. I mean, a recent paper I wrote an article about called Diffusion Policy you Just Need 50 Demonstrations. And you just do self, not self supervised, you just do uh, supervised learning. It's end to end. You have this is what the observation of the robot was, this is what the action was from the demonstrator. Learn it, learn to map it, and it works well. Okay. And out of curiosity, what kind of simulation environment do you use for? Uh, for this work, we use Tactile yeah. Gym 2. There is also Tacto. Uh, yeah, these are the, the two dominant ones so far. But as you see, they're based on really naive simulators. Uh, that was... Uh, my brain stuck. Yeah, never mind. It, it's a very naive simulator. The physics are okay -ish, But in terms of realism, the images are not not even close enough. Okay, to, I to, was to, wondering to, if uh, there was any gazebo or any... Uh, no, no, we don't use kind. gazebo because hmm. <laughs> that's that's an interesting uh, thing because we wanted all the robots in, uh, in in the lab to be ROS2 enabled, so we actually spent a lot of time to operate this robot with serving. And actually nobody uses ROS2 especially for robot learning. There are Python APIs for all the robots, so you don't have to have all this hassle to, to do ROS, Gazebo, whatever. Gazebo was not great, too. It's computationally not efficient at all. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to do... So it, Isaac Jim is very prominent right now, or I don't mm -hmm. know what... They change their name <laughs> quite often. And it's very real, realistic, but still it's missing the tactile sensing. Yeah, that's... And now you have humanoids going out, and every human and robot has a different tactile sensing, uh, tactile sense, reason based, force based. So it's really hard. Actually, one of the works I want to do for the, uh, the foundation model is to make it uh, invariant to what kind of uh, sensing, and it, what kind of tactile sensor you're using to, to detect it. Great. Okay. Any more questions? Last last call. Okay, thank you, Foti. <laughs> I don't know if somebody from the. Hmm? Okay, yeah. Online has a question. No, no, I think it's just yeah, Professor Rustopoulos, nobody else. That's it. Okay, thank, thank you very much again. Thank you.